All right, folks. Good morning. Listen, this is my first time to, uh, to Snowy Mountain Lodge. Pretty nice, eh? If you ask me, good heavens. Uh, and I, it, it really is a kind of, a, of, a, of an evidence of uh, uh, God just doing some really remarkably good things here at the West Institute and so on. And I'm just excited to, to be a part of it. And uh, we have looked forward to and, and prayed about this conference. And thank you so much for being here. Clayton mentioned that you're going to get a dose of the Old Testament. Now, uh, do you have your notes? Honest to goodness, if you don't have a note packet, there's one out there for you and we'll get it to you. Anybody need it? Just raise your hand. We'll fetch them. Because I'd like you to, there, there, as, as Clayton said, there's a lot more here than, uh, than we'll even begin to get through. But I just thought it might be a resource for you. And uh, here, let me, let me ask you a strange question. Do you know uh, Robert Robinson's uh, hymn, Come Thou Fount? All right, if I start the second verse, see if you can say it with me. Come thou found, uh, no, 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 no. Here I raise, can you keep going? Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I trust by thy good pleasure, what? Safely. All right, now, honest to goodness, is that brand new to many of you? Have you heard that before? All right, do you know that in almost every uh, hymn book, and I actually wrote it in here so I'd have it, uh, that has is, is been published in the last several years, they have rewritten that second verse. What is it? Ebenezer, Ebenezer yeah. And, and I, I got it in here somewhere. I just scribbled it in just so I'd have it. But if I can't find it, here it is, here it is. I have an announcement to make. My contact is in backwards, so I'm going to be doing this. I, I didn't have time. It takes me forever to get my contact in and out. But hitherto thy love, all right, and now, here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I trust by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. That's probably familiar to you. It really is magisterial poetry, not only in terms of, I think it's really fine poetry, but it reflects a biblical story almost perfectly. The way he has reduced a hugely important Old Testament story. But it's been replaced by this. Hitherto thy love has blessed me. Thou hast brought me to this place. To this place, yes. And I know thy hand will bring me safely home by thy good grace. I regard that as kind of insipid poetry. And maybe mostly because of the fact that uh, they have excised Ebenezer. What happened to Ebenezer? Uh, you know, uh, I, I haven't taken any, any surveys, but my assumption, I'm pretty confident, I'll bet you this is the case, that hymn writers are publishers of hymn books, because they aren't hymn writers. Robert Robinson is the writer. But publishers of the books have just decided that the Christian public can't be expected to understand a reference to Ebenezer. And, uh, you know, their minds are going to go to Charles Dickens and Christmas Carol, and they're not going to be able to get past that. And so, ah, now... Have I got you? Do you know Ebenezer? Now, here's an interesting thing, and I maybe should wait on this, to, but because we're going to cover this very, very uh, uh, survey Old Testament history, uh, the, the, we're going to survey the Old Testament narrative in just a minute, but here's the point. His reference is to probably the most pivotal story of the Old Testament. Uh, it's a story that is recorded in 1 Samuel 4 to 7, and most of you, if you've spent any time in the Old Testament, you'll recognize this story. It's when the Israelites took the ark into the battle against the Philistines. Now, if you, when I say ark, if you're thinking of a really big boat at this point, <laughs> you need to spend more time in the Old Testament. Can we agree on this? So the ark of the covenant here is that most sacred piece of, of temple furniture. It is the throne of Yahweh with the cherubim and the glory cloud. And, Phil and the Israelites wickedly, remember, the, led by the two, sons of Hophni and Phine uh, the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, and they carry the ark into battle, and the ark is captured. Remember that? And, uh, and, and then what happens is that uh, God brings the ark home, and if you go to Israel with us, we'll sit on you know, the top of Beit Shemesh and look out across the very valley where that ark came back on those two, you remember, on that cart pulled by the two milk cows, you remember? But the point is that uh, God brings the ark home, and then for 20 years, Sam Samuel, you know Samuel, one of the great heroes of the Old Testament, the last of the judges, the only one of the judges who was a national judge, and uh, that wasn't me. 
and I was just a chair. And, uh, but the point is that Samuel goes up and down the countryside for 20 years preaching his little two-point sermon, put away your Baal and Asherah, put away those false gods, trust God and him alone, and, and, and he'll deliver you. And one by one, house by house, Israel begins to repent. And 20 years later, they gather for prayer, and uh, the, the, the Philistines hear about it, and, uh, and they come to attack. And, and I like to say that uh, 20 years earlier, the Israelites trusted in the Ark of God. They trusted in that box as if it was some sort of an amulet or a good luck charm. But now, after 20 years of Samuel's ministry, they don't trust in the Ark of God. They trust in the God of the Ark. And they say, Samuel, pray for us. And Samuel prays, and God sends them rumbling in the earth, and the Philistines flee. And, uh, you know, I always think, if you were one of the enemies of Israel, you, you, you were a neighbor of Israel, and you, on occasion, uh, attacked Israel, if you attacked Israel somewhere in the back of your head, there was a little voice saying, oh, I hope that Yahweh doesn't wake up because, man, he has done some powerful things. And so now here come the Philistines charging up the hill and God just sends a little bit of a rumble and the Philistines turn and flee and Israel destroys them. And, 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 and by the way, a 40 year oppression that is introduced in Judges chapter 10 finally comes to an end as the Philistines are destroyed by the Israelites. That makes sense to you? And Samuel wants the people to remember it. So what does he do? Come on, talk to me. He builds a stone, a stone of remembrance. This is all over Israel. And they'll take a stone and set it up where it's clearly not the natural lay of the stone. And that way when you go by, and they'll always put it at crossroads. It's called a stone of remembrance. Can you say that in Hebrew? Ebenezer. And, uh, and, and, and the idea actually means more than that. But, but Ebenezer has the idea of uh, this far by your help. And so what Samuel is saying is that, and, and, and as I say, you always put it at a crossroads. So now you're making your way along and you got your boy with you and your boy looks at that stone and he says, Dad, what's that stone doing there? Oh, have I got a story to tell you. That's the whole point. But it doesn't just mean thank God for the victory. It means if God gave us this victory, we ought to realize that we trust him the next time. Now think about how significant that is. I always tell people, you need to deliberately raise Ebenezer's in your life because we're all capable of forgetting. And God, God takes us this far, and the next time there's any sort of a challenge, we forget all about that, and he's got to teach us the same thing all over again. But my point is, and this is just by way of introduction, that, that it is a, a shame in my mind that the Christian hymn book publishers have taken it upon themselves to excise that sort of really, see, oh, and I never finished. The fact is that that is, 1 Samuel 47, in my humble estimation, is the grand turning point of the Old Testament. After the Philistines capture the ark, it says in 1 Samuel 6, and this, this, this verse ought to make your blood run cold. The ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines for six, seven months. Those are the darkest seven months in Old Testament history. For the throne of God to be positioned in a Philistine God house and supposedly doing obeisance to Dagon, the Philistine God, uh, it can't get any blacker than that. But after Samuel's ministry, he puts Saul on the throne and then he puts David on the throne. And so when David turns the kingdom over to Solomon, the kingdom is, is at its apex. So you go from the nadir in A-D-I-R, you know, the bottoming out point of the Old Testament, to the apex of the Old Testament, and it's all because of that turning point. Now here, why am I... Here you have a story. And Ebenezer is only a secondary element of the story, but it's really very, very important, and you couldn't be very familiar with that story without coming to grips with Ebenezer. That's how God kind of puts an exclamation point on the story of the battle and so on. So my point is that you have what is a very central, pivotal story, and, uh, and Christians are just generally uh, perceived to be, and, and it's probably true that in many cases they are, but the answer is not to quit using the terminology and talking about the Old Testament, it's to teach it more carefully, wouldn't you say? So all that to say, uh, I, I uh, listen, uh, if you go to the first page of the notes, I, and I don't follow the notes very well, but, but they're there for you, but, uh, folks, I, I, and, and this may seem a strange way to start. The, the, the conference we advertise is uh, truth that, that, that can't be tolerated, something like that, right? And we're going to spend a lot of time in archaeology. And, and the archaeology is absolutely fascinating and, in my mind, mind-numbing as, as to the degree to which it, it, it demonstrates the absolutely uh, unassailable integrity of the Old Testament record. It's, it's really, really important. But... 
In order to understand that, you've got to have your arms around the narrative of the Old Testament. And so that's kind of what I've been deputized to do, to, to just kind of, uh, and, and for many of you, this will be review and you'll be familiar. It may be fairly new to you, uh, but we're going to kind of do two different things out here this weekend. We're going to spend this morning really focusing just on Old Testament survey. And uh, I know where Doug Petrovich is going to take you with regard to the... Uh, uh, the, the uh, archaeological discoveries and so on, I'm going to try and focus in on those points of Old Testament history, make sure you understand them. That makes sense to you? So we're kind of taking a course here, and I'm the uh, rudimentary inter introductory stuff, okay, which is entirely appropriate, but because but, uh, he's the brainiac. But, uh, but uh, having said that, let me, let me just uh, take you to that first page, and I'm going to spend just a few minutes trying to excite you about the Old Testament. And, uh, it, and, and my proposition is simply this, that, that, that every believer ought to be aggressively, deliberately serious about getting his arms well around the Old Testament, about really understanding the Old Testament. And let me say this, this is not in your notes, but there are parts of the Old Testament which are more difficult than others. Start with the easy parts, okay? And the easy part is the part that reduces itself so happily to a flannel graph, right? I'm talking the narrative. The, the, the narrative is exciting and, and it's compelling. Now, and let me tell you one other thing just because it comes to me and I have a totally undisciplined mind. Uh, the thing is, folks, uh, I think in both the Old and New Testament, and we're going to be primarily in the Old Testament. That's where they're going to focus this weekend. But I think in both the Old and the New Testament, are, 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 in, in, in the case of many Christians, we know the stories. We know the story of Abraham offering up Isaac. You know, here, here, let's do a little experiment. I'm just doing that off the top of my head, okay? You got something to write on? All right, so let me give you six names. I'm just going to, I'm making this up, all right? Okay. So write down Moses, Isaiah, uh, Abraham, Enoch, David. Here's a tough one. Zerubbabel. Can you put them in order? Just, just try. Don't even, we don't share this. Can you put them in order? Chronological order. I can't remember the names I give you. So, <laughs> so you're on your own now. Did you get those names? Anybody get all those names? <laughs> this is unrehearsed. Can you tell? Did I give you five? Moses, Isaiah, Abraham. Abraham. I gave you David, so stick David in there. Enoch, David, Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, to Zerubbabel, Z E R U W B A B E L. All right, yeah. See if you can put them in order. Just, just. I'm going to give you a minute. How's that? <laughs> I'm not trying to embarrass anybody, but but I'm trying to make my point that. Now, I probably shouldn't have thrown Zerubbabel in because it, 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 it doesn't fit with what I'm trying to say, as you know the stories. Who is Zerubbabel? He built, the second temple. built the second temple. There's a clue. All right, so who's the first guy on that list? Enoch. Enoch, right? He's uh, in, in, in uh, Genesis 11. He's uh, pre-Abraham. Oops, so who's the second guy? Abraham, Abraham right? Abraham is introduced in Genesis 12. Or actually, we encounter him in Genesis 11, but he's Genesis 12. And uh, he's the first of four patriarchs. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Who's the next guy? Who'd I give you next? Moses. Moses, Moses right? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, Joseph goes down to Egypt. Moses gets him out of Egypt, right? And so who comes next? Who's next? David. It is David, isn't it? Who else did I give you? David. Isaiah. Isaiah. All right, David. David is, uh, of course, one of the three kings of the United Monarchy. He's the second king, Saul first, then David. David comes to the throne in what, uh, Doug, 1051? 1051? No, 1011. 1011, I think. And, uh, and then, of course, there is Isaiah. He's a prophet during what we call the divided monarchy. He's a prophet. He's Hezekiah's court prophet. And then, of course, there is Zerubbabel. He's the last guy, for what it's worth. Zerubbabel's the guy who, uh, who is dispatched by the Persians to rebuild the temple. Uh, he's accompanied by two prophets who uh, encourage the people. You know who those guys are? Haggai and Zechariah. Now, that was a little exercise. But the point is simply that I think a lot of times 
uh, we know the stories, but we're not conscious of the flow and how and 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 history unfolds very very consequentially. That is, this leads to this, leads to that, and so on. And especially the history of Israel, where God is is very much in control. So, so my point is, uh, all right, I'm coming back to it. That I would argue, and that's the point of that first page, that it is a stewardship for every believer to get his arms around the Old Testament. And I give you four reasons. I'm going to spend just a real brief time with each one. The first reason is simply because uh, it's Scripture and God demands it, right? Uh, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is therefore what? Profitable. Profitable. Now, when Paul wrote that, and I don't want to get off on this, but, well, I desperately want to, but I shouldn't. It does. But uh, when Paul wrote that, he certainly had in mind what we call the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, Right? By the way, do you know this, that the word scriptures, as it's used in the Bible, is a very technical word, especially in the New Testament, that the Jewish community, the Jewish believing Christian community, would not use of anything save the word of God. That's what they mean by that, the writings, but it becomes a technical word by the New Testament. In the Old Testament, it's the word and the law, and the, you know, there are all sorts of terms by the time you get to the New Testament. But when Paul says the, uh, uh, all scripture, all in all of its parts is breathed out by God and is therefore profitable, I think you can build the case that he also had in mind the apostolic writings, which are going to become our New Testament. But he certainly meant the Old Testament, for heaven's sakes, and, uh, and, and is profitable. So I could spend a lot more time. Let me go to the second one. Certainly we are under command to know the scriptures. But, but number two is that, and I, this is such an important thought, uh, and it's not mine. Uh, the, the, the New Testament wrote, writers wrote in Greek, but they thought in Hebrew. And folks, what that means is that you need to bring Hebrew thought forms with you when you are reading the New Testament. Does that make sense to you? There are all sorts of uh, thought forms and nuances and ways of expression and so on that are, are Hebrew through and through that are not Greek. But they show up in the New Testament. I'll give you a couple of illustrations real quickly. Number one, do you, I think almost every Christian has sort of a quiet uneasiness about the phrase, Son of God. Because Jesus, we know, is God, very God. And, and to give expression to that, we say that he's the Son of God. But in the back of our mind somewhere, we're saying, yeah, but, the, you know, the Son of God, doesn't that mean that, you know, the Father brings into existence the Son? Isn't Son second generation male descendant, you know? And uh, I know we've got past it, but, but, but let me tell you something. You will not have a breath of difficulty with that if you understand Son in a Jewish setting. How many of you have boys at home? All right. Yours is too old. I think yours is too, Doug. How old is your boy? Ten to thirteen. You got ten to thirteen. All right. What's the thirteen-year-old's name? Isaiah. And ten is Titus. And there's somebody in between. Roland. How, how old? Oh. Uh, Twelve. All right. Say, let's say thirteen. So, if you were to say to Doug, "Do you and your wife have any son?" In a Hebrew setting, honest to goodness, we're going to be technical, and he would. He'd respond this way because this this question to ask somebody if he has a son in a Jewish setting it means more than just do you have a boy who your wife gave birth to, you know. So if I say to him, do you have any sons? He's going to say, yeah, we have one. And we have three boys, right? Let's say 13 is the age now, okay, of bar mitzvah. Because in a Jewish culture, when you bear a, a male child, he's a boy. And there is a point at which that boy is made to be a son. And there are a lot of things that happen, and that is so important and so central to Jewish culture, and that, that, that it, it, it generates a lot of word pictures, a lot of concepts that, that permeate the, the, the culture. Does that make sense to you? And one of them is this. The big one is this, that when the boy becomes a man or a son, he becomes the equal of his father. Now that, that, and, and so all throughout the scriptures, the word son of is, is used to mean equal. Now I can absolutely prove to you, without any shadow of a doubt, that that latter statement is the case, that all throughout the scriptures, the word son of, the phrase son of, is used to mean and is, 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 is understood to mean equal to one with to be identified with. I think it's primarily because of that connection with the bar mitzvah, 
where in the bar mitzvah, the son becomes the equal. There's a man named William Thompson who wrote a, uh, he, he was a traveler in the 1880s, and I haven't read his book. I've read at his book. It's very worthwhile, but, uh, but he traveled through the lands of the Bible in the 1880s, very, very primitive time. And he tells about going across the desert, and he comes to this big, uh, this sheikh, this uh, a chieftain has a, has a place by an oasis, and he's got it all set up there and so on, and he's permanent there. And so he comes and he spends several days with him, and he said every morning it was the same thing. They would gather in the chiefs, in the sheikh, you know, the, the, the patriarch's tent, whatever, and it was kind of a, a raised place, big pillow, and he'd sit up there, and all of his servants would bow before him. And he would assign them. You go to the, you watch the camels, you watch the donkey, whatever in the world. You go to market, you go to, and, and he had several sons, and those sons were on their knees in front of him. And you go here, you go here. And then Thompson says he went away for some time. And uh, when he came back, it was, it, you know, he stayed with him several years later. Same scene every morning. But now one of those sons was sitting next to his father saying, you go here, you go there. Because the son had come of age and now he was the equal of his father. Does that make sense to you? Now that absolutely permeates Jewish culture. So we come to the New Testament and we read that Jesus was the son of God. We're a little off put by it. Uh, but if you have immersed your mind, see, in the Old Testament, uh, and, and again, this shows up so often. When, when, when David uh, is confronted in his sin, remember King David, and he is done wickedly with Bathsheba and against Uriah, and Nathan the prophet comes and confronts him and tells him a little imaginary story about the man who stole his ewe lamb. And when, when David heard that story, David, who's hiding his own sin, Psalm 32, David flies into a rage, and he says, get that man in here, he's going to repay fourfold. And then he says this, as the Lord lives he shall surely die. Now here's what the Hebrew says. And this is, this is spilling out of David. He's, he's angry. Get that man in here. He shall, he shall, he's going to repay fourfold. And as the Lord lives, he is the son of death. Now you see what's going on there? He is one with death. Judas in the New Testament is the son of perdition. Does that have anything to do with his parents? He's on his way to hell. And, and again, there's a remarkable passage where Jesus is... Uh, uh, in Matthew 23, where he's getting after uh, the, 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 uh, the Pharisees of his day, because the Pharisees loved that what they would do. You know, the, in the Old Testament, a number of God's prophets were killed by the Jewish people. And so the people in Jesus' day would build tombs, just monuments, monumental tombs. There's no body in there, to the various prophets. Then as they went by there, just walking across the city, they would, they would honor the, the tombs and so on. And Jesus says this, you build tombs, the prophets, and you say, if we'd have been alive, we wouldn't have killed those prophets. But you go about to kill me, and in so doing, you prove that you are, in fact, the sons of your fathers. Now, you put generational descent into that, and it makes no sense at all. See what I'm saying? You put physical descent in there. But you understand that it means equal to. Does that make sense to you? All right, now I don't want to get lost in this, but there's another one. We, we, and and I'm, 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 I'm mad about this, just so you know. Nobody cares. Nobody pays any attention. But I, uh, my wife sometimes says, calm down. But no. John 3.16. Quote me John 3.16. Is everybody saying it that way? For God so loved the world that he gave his. Do you, do you have all in your head? Nobody got one and only? A lot of people are translating that, I mean, memorizing that out of the NIV, you know, and it's the one and only. It's not what it means. And it really is, it's, it's, it's misrepresentative of best and, and perhaps theologically. But again, what does only begotten mean? Well, you have to think in terms of Jewish culture, the Jewish culture which you encounter so dramatically as you spend time in the Old Testament. In, in, in Jewish culture, uh, they, number one, and this is huge, everywhere you go in the Bible, this is so big. The Jews, not only the Jews, the people of that day, the, the whole culture was built around clans, around extended families. You, you didn't really think, that now you would have a national identity and so on, but both in the Old Testament where there might be some king, in the New Testament and so on, where you might be under some, some Gentile power, you didn't depend upon those Gentile powers or that king in the Old Testament to really protect you. If somebody broke into your house, you didn't call 911. There's nobody picking that phone up, you know what I'm saying? You, 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 your clan had to put together a, a remember when Abraham... Uh, has his little clan down there in Beersheba and some kings. This is Genesis 14, come and carry off Lot. Remember that? What does Abraham do? Puts together a militia. 
goes after them. That's what your clan does. Your life is your clan. You want your clan to be large. But the point is, the clan was led by really the elders of the clan. And then among those elders, there would be one individual who was the ruling father. Can you say that in uh, Latin English? Ruling father. Ruling would be princely or ruling is arcos. Father is? In, in Latin, though, it's pater. So you got pater, arcos, patriarch. The patriarch is the ruling father. When you say patriarch, you're talking about this clan. Does that make sense to you? Now, the point is that it was the role of the father, the patriarch, to, to, to choose which of his sons would succeed him in that place. And it was a very important, very honorific title. Uh, that was more than a title. It was a position. Does that make sense to you? So the one who would succeed, this is the Joseph story. Now, there are several, remember, Joseph is given the coat with big sleeves. There went some flannel graphs again, I know, but, <laughs> but uh, uh, that's probably what it is. But uh, he was given the, uh, the, the, the coat which designated him as the successor to, to uh, Jacob. Does that make sense to you? And that's why his brothers were so jealous. Now, there were several titles. And by the way, that, that son would be given the double portion. And, and, and that shows up a number of times in the Bible. And I hear people think about the double portion as if uh, the son that got the double portion got twice what his father had. Well, that'd be a neat trick. You know, if you could die and leave twice what you got, for heaven's sakes. It might make your sons a little anxious for you to leave, you know. But the point is that he got twice what his brothers got. So that when the father died, if he has six sons, you divide his property seven ways, and one boy gets the double portion, because that signifies that he's going to step into the place of leadership, and he's going to have to give time to that, and so he's, he's, he's given twice the portion. that makes sense to you? But you know where I'm going. There are several titles which could be given that, and one of them is only begotten. And, and in Hebrews chapter 11, Isaac is called the only begotten son of Abraham. One and only? <laughs> Can you say Ishmael, for heaven's sakes, and the sons of Keturah? So he's clearly not the one and only son. He is the only begotten. Now, we have trouble with that, too, because, because you know, that phrase, only begotten. Oh, I'm getting lost in this. I'll quit. But there's a huge discussion that goes on in the world of, of, of systematic theology over how to understand this idea that Jesus was the only begotten. And the standard way that, the, that, that they deal with it, everybody deals with it, is to say, well, Jesus, what's the problem if you say Jesus is begotten? The word actually means to begin to exist, called into existence. That's what it means. Oh, we got trouble here. And so the way the Christian world has responded to that, and this is, in my mind, a just, uh, it, I, it, 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 it makes no sense at all, is the doctrine of eternal generation. Hmm? That's what, <laughs> eternal generation. He began to be, but he began to be eternally. That could not be more oxymoronic. You know, there are, there are times where theologians just park enough words next to each other that it sounds like they said something. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and that's one of them. And the fact of the matter is that the whole thing comes from that reference in John that Jesus is the only begotten. And you understand it in a Jewish setting. The New Testament writers use Greek, but they think Hebrew. They think Jewish. And in Jewish culture, that's not any problem. It means he is the son who is going to rule in this, in, 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 with his father's authority. That's what it means. Only begotten is the son who has been deputized to rule over the universe. By the way, here's another phrase that can be used for that son who is going to be given the place of authority. He is the firstborn. Now, you know, in the book of Colossians, chapter 1, Paul is responding to a heresy there in Colossae, which fundamentally denies the deity of Jesus. And, and Paul just ransacks Old Testament thought, gr Greek philosophical thought, and so on, to make the point that Jesus is God, very God. And one of the phrases he uses is, he is the firstborn of all creation. You got a Jehovah's Witness, stops at your door, accidentally drops his apostate Bible, it's going to flop open to Colossians 1. That's their verse. Firstborn of all creation. So of all the things that were ever created, he was first. That's their big argument. Read it Jewishly. Does that make sense to you? He is the one who sits in authority over all creation. 
Who can that be but God? See the point? It's just so interesting that Paul's making the point of deity there, and it gets twisted on its head because we think just learn to read the Bible in its own context. And the best way to immerse yourself in that context is to read the Old Testament. Does that make sense to you? In, in, uh, in, in Luke 13, Jesus says, uh, all right, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a story where a, uh, Jesus is, is, is it's just about six months before, uh, uh, a little less than that. It's about five months before he dies. And uh, he has fled from Jerusalem, where he's in danger, over to Perea. And some Jewish uh, leaders come over to try and, and, and trick him back into Judea, where they can have their way with him. And, uh, and they say, Herod wants to kill you. And Jesus says, I'm not worried about that. He says this. Uh, remember, the, the Pharisees say, you better get out of here. Herod, Herod wants to kill you. And, and, uh, uh, and, and Jesus says, you go tell that fox that I am going to walk today and tomorrow, and on the third day, I'll, I'll, I'll return. To, to Jerusalem. And people look at that and they say, what is that all about? The today and tomorrow and the third day. And the commentary is one, we don't know enough about what's going on in his life right there. We don't have the records not full. We don't happen every day. So what's he talking about today and tomorrow? He says it twice in that passage. Folks, it's a Hebraism and it's a Hebraism that spending time in the Old Testament will get you used to. And you know it. You may not appreciate what it means, but you know it. Because it's called the numerical progression. It's a literary device. By the way, time out. The Bible was written to be read out loud. And so you, you have to understand that, that whatever the author intended to communicate as to emphasis or, or focus and so on, he couldn't depend on punctuation marks. You know what I'm saying? He, he had to build it into the text. And there were a number of ways that the Hebrew is very, very good at that. And, and one of those ways to communicate intensity or fullness is what's called a numerical progression, because it's in the text. All right, I'll give you one. Six things the Lord hates, what? Seven are abomination to him. Three things are too, more, are too difficult for me. Indeed, four are more than I can comprehend. You have this a number of times, the prophets use it a number of times. It always communicates fullness. The point is not that there are only seven things that God hates, but he really, really hates those seven. Does that make sense to you? Now, what is Jesus saying? The Pharisees are trying to trick him over into, into, into Judea, and he says, you know what, I'm going to walk today and tomorrow on the third day, when the time is full. That's what he's saying. When, when the time is appropriate, when the time is full, then I'll come. So you go tell Herod, nuts to him. Now, the point is that you, you don't see that unless you've trained your mind to read Jewishly. Does that make sense? And let me just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step on some of your toes here real quickly. <laughs> I understand that there is a place for dynamically equivalent translations, you know, where they you, you take all the work out of it for you. But when you're studying the Bible, study it in a translation which is formally equivalent. Do you know what I'm talking about? Dynamic equivalence is the idea that we're going to take the meaning of the text and put it so simple for you that we're going to take all the work out of it and so on. Whereas a formal, here, in dynamic, this is the NIV. It's the message. It's the, you know, uh, 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 Ken Taylor, the Living Bible. Uh, there may be a place, I'm, oh, I shouldn't say that, there is a place. Might be good for children. Might even be good for a brand new Christian. But don't try to really mature your faith on those kind of Bibles. Because they've just crippled us. You see, the, the whole idea of what's called dynamic equivalence is we're going to, the translator feels the most responsibility to the reader. And so in order to make it easy for the reader, and they want it at comic book level. That's, that's what they're taught. Put it at comic book level. So what they're taught, uh, what they do is they take the text and they bring it into the culture of the reader. When I was a kid, they had this Bible called the, uh, the Blue Denim Bible. It had a blue denim cover. Anybody else? I'm the old guy in the room. But, and I had a few psalms and so on. It was for the kid in the street. And they thought, well, kid in the street, he's never seen a sheep or a shepherd. What does he know? So Psalm 23, 1 became, the Lord is my traffic cop. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of things wrong with that. But my point is, do you, do you see what's going on there? They're trying to say, well, the kid's not going to understand shepherd. 
Now, in a formal equivalence, now watch this. In dynamic equivalence, the primary responsibility is to the reader, and therefore the, the translator takes the text and brings it into the culture of the reader. With formal equivalence, the translator's primary stewardship or responsibility is to the text. I have to represent the text. And therefore, he demands that the reader step into the culture of the text. He's not going to bring the text into the culture of the reader. He's going to demand that the reader step into the culture of the text. It's more work. Get you a good study Bible. A good study Bible, that not, not so much theological. That's the ESV study Bible. But get a good study Bible that, 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 that uh, the problem I have, I'm really wandering here. The problem I have with theological study Bibles is that, you know, okay, <laughs> this will only work for some of you. But you got a fairly new believer. He's reading 1 John 2. Jesus is the propitiation for your sins and not for yours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Sounds like Jesus' death was sufficient for the whole world. There's a whole set of doctrines. You've got a study Bible that the whole world here doesn't really mean whole world. It just means the elect. Well, that may be. I don't think it is, but that may be. But I'd like you to don't read the Bible through your theology. Develop your theology through the Bible. So, so what, what you're doing when you're reading the Bible is trying to understand the meaning of the text. And the meaning does not what does, is not what it means to you. I always say, if you sit down, open your Bible, and ask yourself the question, I'm going to read this passage, what does it mean to me? Shame on you. You open the Bible, and you say, what does it mean? And that means, what did the original author intend the original audience to understand. What does it mean? Now, once you've answered that question, then shame on you if you get up without asking yourself, what does it mean to me? But you don't start with what does it mean to me, right? Does that make sense to you? You say, what does it mean? And the fact is that, that uh, a good study Bible is one that will explain uh, geography, culture, things like this. Just, just help you understand the text so like I say, here's the guy who doesn't understand what a sheep is. Okay, put a little sh picture of a sheep in the margin, you know, and say this is what a sheep is, this is what a shepherd is, and so on. And, and, but the kid's not going to be confused that that margin is actual Bible. He knows, that's explaining. Whereas if he reads, the Lord is my traffic cop, he's going to say, man, did they have traffic cops back then? You know, I mean, he's going to think that's what it says. It's not what it says. Now that happens everywhere in the Bible, so I'm just saying, get as close to you as you can to what the text says. And the other thing with the, okay, knock it off, Buckman. But the other thing with the, with, the, with the dynamic equivalence is he has to decide what it means before he translates it. See, I want, the, I want the translator to give me the text and I'll do the interpretation because I'm a believer priest and I'm going to answer to God. I don't want the translator to do the interpretation and then put it in the text so that I can't, I, I don't even know there's an issue there. You know what I'm saying? He's already decided everything for me. All right, now that's not what I'm here to talk about. So I'm saying, i got to quit. Number one, I have no idea what time it is, by the way. <laughs> what time is it? Oh, I'm, a, I'm out of gas. All right, let me just finish this. Very quickly, number one, it's commanded. Number two, uh, the Old Testament writers, I'm sorry, the New Testament writers write in Greek, but they think in Hebrew. Number three, and this is very closely related, and I'll just say it, there are so many ways in which, uh, well, here's a principle. Here's a really, really important principle. Wherever you are in the Bible, God expects you to bring with you, bring with you everything he already said. This is a doctrine we call progressive revelation. And by progressive revelation, we simply mean that God did not back an 18-wheeler up to the Garden of Eden, you know, and just kaplunk on Adam and say, you sort it out. Uh, the fact is that God is, a, is an infinitely wise teacher. He knows that he's working with almost infinitely slow students, and so he has carefully parceled out truth. But that truth, I like to picture it as a stair step. And God gives truth, and men are responsible to absorb and embrace and bow the knee to that truth. And it's a lot of times challenging truth, and, but God gives you time. And then another generation comes along, and he gives more truth. Now, the progress of revelation is never from error to truth. God doesn't say that A back here and say, oops, not A really B up here, right? But it's from truth to greater truth, and everything... Go to Hosea real quick. If you've got your Bible, can you find Hosea? It's right after Daniel. Uh, 
Hosea 2. Uh, this is a really skinny little illustration, but Hosea chapter 2 and verse 15. Now, Hosea uh, Hosea's the prophet. You know, it wasn't always easy to be a, a, a prophet of God. Matter of fact, it was seldom easy. And uh, in many cases, in order to get his, his message across, God would demand uh, really remarkable sacrifices of the prophets. And in many cases, those sacrifices had to do with their families. For instance, what did God demand of Jeremiah, remember, with regard to his family? What did he demand? Tell me. He wanted to get married. Because, Jose, because Jeremiah was going to live at the time when the temple was going to be destroyed, and uh, he didn't want him, and it was going to be awful suffering. He didn't want his life to be, it's kind of 1 Corinthians 7, to be, he wanted him to be un, unencumbered. Uh, Isaiah had to, had to give his kids those goofy names, remember? Uh, hasty, hasty to the spoil, you remember? And um, Ezekiel, remember what God demanded of Ezekiel? Ezekiel actually uh, lived when the, when the temple was destroyed, and God wanted to make the point that even though they cherished the temple because this was God's hand, they were not to mourn over the temple. And to make that point, God said to Ezekiel, he said, tonight I will take from you the desire of your eye, of your heart, and you are to neither mourn nor cover yourself with ashes. And the next verse says, and that night my wife died. Well, that's heavy stuff. And the next day, he had to go back to business. Hosea was called upon to marry this woman who proves to be a harlot. Remember that? And uh, she bears him these, these children, and he gives those children rather instructive names. So it was a heavy thing. He, and he had to buy his wife back from the slave market and so on. So he marries this unfaithful wife, and on top of that, it was not, that's not bad enough, her name is Gomer, you know. <laughs> God was really beating up on poor Hosea. But, but, but the point is, he gives, all right, now here's my point. God commands them to give their children, the first name, the child is named Loami, which means not my people. That's so huge. At Mount Sinai, God said, I will be your God and you will be Ami. And now Hosea gives his, his child a name that means Loami, not my people. And God has revealed himself as a God of mercy, but Hosea gives his, his, his child a name that means lo rukamah, that means no mercy. And the third one is Jezreel, God will sow. But God says that I'm going to, I'm going to reverse that. I'm going, and the day is going to come when I will rescue my people and lo ami will be ami. And lo rukamah will be rukamah. And, and actually, there's a bit of a pun here. Jezreel, and it's just a slightly different, it comes out the same in the English, will be, it's, it's two different, uh, very close consonants that are used, but Jezreel will be Jezreel. And what he means is, the, the, the God, the, it can mean either God will scatter or God will sow, S-O-W. So God who scatters will be the God who sows you in the land, who plants you in the land. And then he gives this promise. Now, I'm so all that backdrop. I just, I, I hate taking verses, just picking them out of context. But then as a part of this promise, and this is my skinny little point. Look at verse 15. God says, I will give her, Israel, the vineyards from there and the valley of Achor as a door of hope. Now, my point is, wherever you are in the scriptures, God wants you to bring with you everything he already said. And, and to me, this kind of illustrates it because what is the valley of Achor? Now, almost everybody in the room knows you just don't know it's the valley of Achor. You probably have cross references that'll get you there. You know what happened in the Valley of Achor? Remember uh, Achan, the guy who stole the gold at Jericho, and when they went up to Ai, they were defeated. So then they passed the lots, and they drew the lots out, and they found out it was Achan, and they took Achan and they stoned him to death in the Valley of Achor. Now, hear what God's doing here. This is a beautiful picture. He is saying, you're going to go through hard times. But the only way to find God's blessing is to allow God to purge the sin. So just as back there in, 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 in the days of Joshua and Achan, God, God purged the sin by, by, in the Valley of Achor, I will give you the Valley of Achor. Now you see, it's a beautiful, pregnant word picture. But it doesn't make any sense unless you know what happened to the Valley of Achor. And he doesn't stop and tell the story. That's all I'm saying. He doesn't say, you remember back there in Achor, Achor, and so on. He expects you to bring it with you. Does that make sense to you? And I can't say how strongly that I, I feel about that in the New Testament. I, my theology prof, Dr. McCune, used to say that every single doctrine of the New Testament is firmly grounded in the Old Testament, save one, and that is the local church. But, but you, you, you are so, oh, I, I got to quit. I, 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 because there's something even more important. So I'm saying you ought to study the Old Testament. You're under command. 
you're going to understand the New Testament a lot better because, number one, they use Old Testament thought forms again and again. And number two, they, uh, the, 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 God expects you to bring with his building consciously. But here's the thing, folks, and I want to get serious with you. You and I are beneficiaries of new covenant blessings. I don't think we consciously, we're, we're not as conscious of that as we ought to be. And, and the Bible is quite explicit about what those new covenant blessings are. Now, Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36, the new covenant is actually made with Israel, and Israel is one day going to enjoy it. We are the dogs that get the crumbs that fall from the table. That's what we are. But the fact of the matter is that we have been made the happy beneficiaries of, of these remarkable new covenant blessings. And one of the reasons that God has ordered it in this fashion is because as we live out that new covenant existence, we make jealous the people of Israel. That's Romans 11. That's one of our roles, and we ought to do it compassionately and lovingly. But we have these new covenant blessings. Now, here's the point. What, is, what are those new covenant blessings? Two primary things. What does it mean? What began at Pentecost? What really does it mean to live under the, uh, 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 enjoying new covenant blessings? Two things. This is so big. And by the way, I don't think we can really come to grips with this unless we consciously measure it against the Old Testament. Because the first blessing of new covenant is sins once and for all forgiven. Hebrews 8 quotes the whole chapter of Jeremiah 31 to make this. Now, folks, think about what this means. In the Old Testament, and you know, we, we can have kind of a contemptuous, sometimes we read Paul a little carelessly, and he's so glad we're not under the law and so on. So we'll kind of, you know, have a, have a dismissive or contemptuous or cynical attitude toward the law. Listen, the law was an expression of a good and gracious God who took up his residence in the middle of a people and invited them to approach him and so on and laid before them and, and he offered them forgiveness. He offered them these marvelous sacrificial system by which they could come and, 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 and offer these sacrifices. And as they left, the priest was duly authorized to say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine. That number six thing, that's not Hallmark stuff, business, folks. That is, that is the priest saying, and, 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 and give you what? The Lord, and give you shalom. You have peace with God. This is a blessedness. So in the Old Testament, there was forgiveness of sins, but you never offered your last sacrifice. And, and, and so there was just never that that measure of confidence that you and I can have, knowing that one sacrifice was offered up that fully satisfied God's wrath. They didn't know that. They didn't, they, they, it wasn't revealed to them. It wasn't available to them. And so, the, you know, one of, the, one of the curious things about the tabernacle temple is it says, you know, the tabernacle temple is laid out in such detail and so on. Every little scintilla, uh, you know, how it's to be built, what, what uh, material and so on. But there's one thing that's rather conspicuously absent from any, either tabernacle or temple, and that is a bench or a chair. There's no bench or chair. And, and Paul suggests that it's because if there were a bench or a chair, one of the priests might get tired one day and sit there, and you'd have the idea that he was done. He was never done. There was always another sacrifice to be offered. Jesus offered himself up, and what did he do? He sat down. That's the point. He sat down. So that, now... Contemplate what it means, folks, to live on this side of the cross and the empty tomb and to realize that you and I have sins once. That's new covenant stuff. And it's a blessedness, isn't it? But there's something else in Ezekiel 36. And that is what I like to call after my uh, best friend in the world, one of my very, very best friends who wrote a book called The New Covenant Ministry of the Holy Spirit. He's our dean, Dr. Larry Pettigrew. And he does as well with this as anybody on earth. But, but I like to call it that. There is the, the other new covenant blessing is the new covenant ministry of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible is so explicit that the, minister, the Spirit ministers to you and me in a way that he could not minister to the Old Testament saint, to Moses, to David, to, to any Old Testament saint. He couldn't minister. And, and there are books written, and that's one of them, and so on, that sort of contemplate what is. What's the distinction between the ministry of the, 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 the Spirit in the Old Testament and the clearly better and more blessed ministry of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament? I believe you can reduce it to one word, and this is where I'm taking you. Now, I, 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 what I'm saying is, what's the difference between the ministry of the, Old, the Spirit in the Old Testament and the ministry of the Spirit in the New Testament? And I think you can reduce it to this one word, and that one word, bless God, is intimacy. You and I enjoy an intimacy with the Father 
that the Old Testament saint would have been horrified to hear you talk about. You know, in the Old Testament, as I say, you were invited to approach God at the temple, but you only came so far. You only come as far as the outer court. And you would never go into the holy place, let alone the Holy of Holies. We are invited to come boldly into the Holy of Holies. So here you have in the Old Testament this very deliberately gracious but off-putting, off-setting. You stay that far. We, we are, you know, I cannot find any place in the Old Testament where a Old Testament saint consciously, deliberately thinks of, him, of God as his personal father. They knew him as Lord and creator and master and, and deliverer and, 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 and uh, a savior and so on. But you don't find them talking about God as father. Folks, <laughs> this takes your breath away. We know God not only as father, we know him as Abba, as Papa. Now you think about that. You think about what that means, that you and I have this intimate relationship which has been communicated by the Spirit because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. And we are invited to come boldly to the very throne. Now here's my point, and I'm, I got a point. I believe that with that remarkable intimacy which has been vouchsafed us by the finished work of Jesus Christ and which is ministered to us deliberately by the Spirit of God, along with that intimacy which is ours on this side of the cross, there is a besetting sin. And that besetting sin is a, a carelessness about the bottomless majesty of the God with whom we have been invited to enjoy that intimate relationship. And there's only one antidote. It's the Old Testament. You saturate your mind. You know, the New Testament spends very little time really with, with, with the character of God. That's done. Wherever you are in the Bible, God expects you to bring with you everything you already said. And he's made the point that this is a thrice holy God and that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom and ought to grip our hearts. But now he reveals that we can have this intimate relationship. And I think it is horribly, horribly dangerous to pretend that we can rightly enjoy the bottomless blessedness of new covenant intimacy without saturating our soul spirits in all that God has already revealed concerning his character and his majesty. Does that make sense to you? You need to spend time in the Old Testament. Now, it's not a, it's not, it's not a laborious thing. It's delightful. It's fun. Now, at the bottom of the page, I give you a number of things. I'm not going to spend the time. We're late already, but, uh, although I'm cheating my own time here. But, but uh, uh, you know, I won't go through them. Look at the bottom one. <laughs> so... Uh, I, and I, I really encourage you in that regard. And, and I love to take people to Israel. I got back from Israel a week ago Thursday. And, and uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it, it's a huge blessing. As God is just as providences are so sweet in my life. And I have the opportunity two, two or three times a year to take people to Israel. I always say that if you're going to... If you're going to teach, you're always helpful to have visual aids. You know, well, God's given us a big blackboard you can walk around on over there. And, and, and you, can, you can stand in the places and contemplate those narratives. And, and we'll make up the point in the next session that, that so much of the Bible is history. And it's important history. And when you read those historical narratives, you, you generate a mental picture. That's fine, but it's wrong. I'm just telling you, you got it wrong. you got to go there and learn that land to appreciate it and so on. So I, I just encourage you. But... The most important thing is this, and let me just leave this with you. And, and I, I like to think that this weekend could be a down payment on, on, on this particular effort. Because my point is simply that, that what I want to leave with you is that, is that you need to give yourself to it very consciously. Develop a plan. Read the Old Testament. Read it carefully. Go to where the Old Testament is taught. I always say, as you read the Old Testament, answer the questions as you go. Get yourself a little study library. Find somebody who knows the Old Testament well. Uh, I'm, I'm not an Old Testament scholar, but I, I, I love to spend time in it. And any time you've got a question, you want to drop me an email, I'd love to interact with you. But my point is, I think when we read it again and again, we say, I don't know what that means. Maybe someday I'll figure it out. Figure it out that day. So as you read, you, you get your arms around those passages. Start with the historical narrative. Learn the historical Genesis to Nehemiah. That's the historical narrative. Well, Esther goes back in there. But, but uh, know that, you know, 
uh, universal dealings, Abraham's called, patriarchal, down to Egypt, Moses gets them out, Joshua gets them into the land, uh, tells them to destroy the Canaanites, they don't do it, the period of the judges, bottoming out, last judges, Samuel, make us a king, Saul, David, Solomon, foolishness, the kingdom is divided, northern kingdom carried off to Samaria, southern kingdom carried off to Judea, 70 years, come back, rebuild their temple, rebuild their city, the Old Testament closes. That's the whole Old Testament narrative. I just walked you through it, so there you are. But, but, but you ought to just get your arms around that narrative. Does that make sense to you? Genesis to Nehemiah. And uh, All right, well, let me have a word of prayer with you, and we'll take a break. What's, what, what's the schedule now, Clayton? 15 minutes, and then we'll come back, and I just cheated myself. So, All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for... We worship you, first of all, God as God. You are the creator. It is infinitely appropriate that you be honored and celebrated and worshiped, that your glory be acknowledged, and we do all of that. And we are anxious for you to teach us who you are more carefully. But then, Father, we confess that our hearts are glad because not only of who you are, but what you have wrought on our behalf. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the wonderful day in which we live, in which we have a completed scripture. We thank you that that which was only anticipated in the Old Testament is made full in the new, and we can rejoice in that. We thank you for the standing we have, this marvelous new covenant standing that we have. But Father, we're anxious to be, we're anxious to be careful students of your scripture in all of its parts in order that we might be stewards. We might put it to work. We have to know it in order to obey it. So, Father, instruct us. Uh, thank you for these students. Thank you for those who have traveled. Father, make it a profitable weekend. And, Father, I would pray that uh, we might go away from this place not only uh, encouraged and instructed, but emboldened in terms of sharing our faith and building into our faith in our own lives. Thank you, Father, for who you are and for the marvelous prospect of this weekend. In Christ's name, amen.